Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host Mitchell J. Rabin and I'm very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We have invited to join us Kate Rayworth, who is an economist and is the author of this book, Donut Economics. She has been an economist actually for many years. She teaches at Oxford University at the Environmental Change Institute. She is in New York very briefly, and we were lucky enough to bring her onto the show. She's looking to change the world through the domain of economics, something, of course, that we're all dealing with all the time. And we're economic animals, if you will. And so bringing another level of intelligence and creativity to the subject with heart, I may say, makes a huge difference and can make a big impact on our planet. That's why we wanted to have Kate with us here today to learn more about her approach, which is a very hands-on practical approach, as well as having an underlying ideology to it. So, uh, hi, Kate. Hello. Very nice to be here. So good to have you. Thank you. So, um, that was a big, long paragraph that said a lot in a short amount of time. Um, but it's about where you've been, where you're going, what you're doing. Why don't you first just give us a little sketch of your own personal background, and then from there we'll go into kind of the, the bread and butter of donuts. Sure. <laughs> so even as you're introducing me and you're saying Kate Ray was an economist, this part of me goes, oh, can, me? I re can I really say I'm that? Because when I was a student at university studying economics 25 years ago. At Oxford. At Oxford University. I went to university to study economics because I wanted to change the world. And I knew that economics is the language of public policy. It's the mother tongue. And if you want to be part of changing the world, you feel you need to understand this language. But I was so frustrated and disappointed in what I was taught because most of the issues that I cared about, like social justice, environmental integrity, were pushed to the margins of the theory. And so I walked away from economics and I was way too embarrassed to call myself an economist because who would ever want to admit to being that? So you see, as you say now, she's an economist, I think, oh, but I'm not one of those, I'm not one of those because it's, it's, I'm so distressed by the training that it gives you. So I walked away from it. I'm it's almost the equivalent of saying, hi, I'm here to destroy your planet. Yeah, I mean, it <laughs> and makes... Keep the, and keep the, the riches for ourselves. Yeah, it's certainly, if you say to people, I'm an economist, there is a little bit of a drawback that you... Yeah. Maybe, you know, I'm a banker, I'm an economist. So I never used that word. And I immersed myself in real-world economic challenges. So I worked for three years in the villages of Zanzibar, working with people, I call them barefoot entrepreneurs, women who had nothing to live off except... So you left Oxford, yeah. you didn't graduate. Oh, I did graduate. Oh, you I did. did. I finished my degrees, but my professors were saying, stay and do a PhD. You oh, I do see. do a PhD, and I just said, well, I, I don't Be want to... Be in the to, world of academia. I don't want to go further and further into this thing. I want to, to immerse myself in the real world. So I got a job that took me to Zanzibar. Zanzibar. And I ended up working in the villages of Zanzibar, uh, helping the poorest people in the community going to women's groups and uh, men I met living in the forest who were wood carvers, saying to them, look, there's all these tourists come to your islands who's, who've arrived here completely insensitive to your culture. So they're walking around in skimpy bikinis, not even knowing that this is a Muslim country. They are staying in very luxurious hotels where the price of uh, the land has now gone through the roof. And they're building these wonderful big um, sort of huts that the price of coconut palm roofing had gone through the roof, so local mm. people couldn't afford it. Price of fish has gone through the roof. So locals were just getting all the downsides of tourism. And I thought, what can I do that can help them actually get something out of it? So I spent three years going around the villages saying, show me what you make. I've got half local eyes and I speak your language, but I've got half the eyes of a tourist. I can help you improve what you're making for the sake of selling it towards the tourist market, whether mm. it's improving mm. the quality or changing the design. And it was one of the most rewarding jobs I'll have in my life. But the, the women I was working with, and the, they were largely women, but they were w women and men, who had nothing to survive of except for their wits, the materials around them, the forest they lived in, and the community. 
and I saw how they raised kids without running water or school nearby. Mm. Did so, they have electricity? Oh, no. No, no, no electricity. Not at all. So it was a really foundational experience in my life, actually. And whenever sure. I think of poverty um, or marginalized people, I go back to those villages in my head, and it keeps me very sure. grounded in that reality. Sure. No, I, I really get it. Having traveled to a number of third world countries, mm. so-called developing countries, mm. um, I go in order to have that kind of experience. Mm. I haven't done what you've done, which I think is just brilliant, but um, I have a feel for that kind yeah. of foundational yeah. character of living, so I very much appreciate it. Prior to the onset of, or the onslaught, I should say, of tourism in that area, how did the people sustain? Well, the islands in Zanzibar were traditionally, um, their, their income came from cloves. Oh. They were the known as the clove islands or the spice islands. They grew oh. cloves and there were clove trees all over Zanzibar. And they were so important that it was illegal to cut down a clove tree. But most of those cloves were being exported to Indonesia to put in clove cigarettes. And that's why oh. it was so valuable. They got massive foreign exchange of selling cloves. Well, then the Indonesians got wise and they planted their own clove trees. And almost overnight, the entire economy of Zanzibar was exposed. And... But the crazy thing was the government never changed the law. So it was still illegal to cut down a clove tree. So you could go and there were massive plantations of clove trees covered in cloves, but nobody would pick them because it wasn't worth it. There was no market. So it was very strange to work in this economy that was stuck in the past and, you see, and yet people struggling, and highly entrepreneurial every day, trying to make, make ends meet, make ends invent meet. something, provide for their kids. So how did... I imagine that donut economics kind of emerged to some extent from your experiences there in Zanzibar. Certainly not at the time, but when I came to creating what now is the concept of the donut, I was definitely reaching back in my mind to those experiences. So now, if you would, mm. tell us a bit about the donut. Okay, so let's jump from the villages of Zanzibar to yeah. donuts and the kind yes. that people eat here in, in America. London, in America. <laughs> no, no, American. <laughs> yeah. So the one with the hole in the middle the guy that you guys eat here. Yeah. So imagine a donut with a hole in the middle. That hole in the middle is a space of deprivation. It's a place where people are falling short on life's essentials, where they're lacking food or water, decent housing, health care, education, political voice, income, work, electricity, the basics that enable people today to lead a life of dignity and opportunity and community. So I call the, the inside crust of that donut a social foundation. We want to get everybody out of the hole in the middle over a social foundation so everybody in the world can lead a decent life. But we must also make sure we don't go beyond the outer crust of the donut because out there we're overshooting our pressure on the planet. We're putting so much pressure on this planet that we are kicking it out of the extraordinary stable state it's been in for the last 11,000 years. You mean since we have what we call civilization, human uh, civilization? In fact, way long back, that would be oh, like the last yeah. three, four, five thousand years. Since humanity first started walking out of Africa across the continents and, and people settling in different then, all of that's happened. You know, the, the, the Holocene has been the most beneficial time to us. The stability of the last 11,000 years is the time actually coincides really interestingly with when people in all sorts of different continents started practicing agriculture and it makes sense because when this when the ice ages ended and you know you used to have these very up and down variation of the world's temperature <laughs> and then suddenly it became much more stable and once it becomes stable then it makes sense to trust in the seasons to plant seeds and expect the crop crops to grow right. to to work with the weather because you believe its regularity so it, it enabled humanity to produce more food for us to expand our population and to create civilizations and thrive so there's a whole story around that that I don't want to overly unfold right now yeah. from the hunter gatherers yes, into that. Yes. And it's actually very interestingly described in a wonderful book named Ishmael, which Aha. became very, very popular, especially in the United States. Daniel. Oh, gosh. I don't um, know. Yeah. And it talks about and I can't tell you. Everyone who reads it is sworn to secrecy to not reveal who the teacher is in the book. It sounds very funny. I'm going to have but to read it But it starts now. with a B, yes. Uh, but 
But to come back, so we got we, we want to get out you've of the hole that, in the middle of the donut. And then you've got the uh, the growth of farming and That's agriculture. That's right. Right. So, so, so take it from there. Sure. Yeah. So so we've had this extraordinary stable phase. The last eleven thousand years of the Earth has been incredibly benevolent, and only around thirty years ago did Earth system scientists start asking themselves. What is it about this phase of the planet's history that's made it so stable and benevolent? And they identified, a couple of years ago, around nine critical Earth system processes that they say, we think these are the nine ones that are keeping the Earth system in a stable state. So the climate, having a stable climate. Surely. Uh, biodiverse abundant, bi abundance of biodiversity, healthy oceans, a healthy ozone layer protecting us from... UV sun's rays. Right. They have nine, and they say if we kick ourselves over these what they call planetary boundaries, so we actually cause climate change, uh, convert too much of the Earth's surface for human use, acidify the oceans, we risk tipping Earth out of this stable state. So come back to the donut. We want to get everybody out of that hole in the middle and end deprivation for all people in the world. But we need to come back within a pressure on the planet that enables it to stay stable. So I consider this as a, a, the donut is really a picture of human progress in the 21st century, in which we meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. So how do you, I, I love the idea and I love the, um, the imagery. How do you propose to do that from where we are now? What kind of reformation, transformation, revolution would need to take place to get from where we are now and in, embrace the donut without devouring it. <laughs> <laughs> so many transformations are needed, of course, in terms of global governance and, and national governments, in terms of democracy, in terms of the way we use technologies. But I came back to my roots, which was my economics education. Because what I saw when I first drew that donut picture, the question that came to me is, if getting into the donut is humanity's 21st century challenge, What's the economic mindset that will give us even half a chance of getting there? Because it most certainly is not the one that students are learning at university today. <laughs> because the way we're taught economics today ignores the natural world largely. It, it pushes it to the margins. It doesn't tackle and address the fundamentals that would be required to be taken account of if we're well, going to get Well, it doesn't address space. the fullness of human emotion, right. such as the wish toward... Uh, generosity, toward compassion, toward share and share alike, which we learned as kindergartners. Just a few basic things like that. Exactly. Love, so it love. Brought, exactly. It brought me back to, well, when I drew the donut, it had a huge impact. I was amazed by the, the, the way it spread around the world, the way it was used in, people would tell me it's being used in China, it was being used in Europe, mm. in the US, it was being shown in so many presentations. People were talking about it. And I thought oh. that's... That's, uh, that's really strikes me, the power of a picture. The power of a picture to yeah, change a paradigm yeah. and to change the way we think. And then I thought, if pictures are powerful, what are the pictures that were put in my head as an yes. economic student? And I went back to the textbooks and I unearthed the key pictures that had given me this very limited 20th century mindset in economics. And I thought, I'm going to root these pictures out, but I'm going to replace them with something what better. What were the pictures? Well, let me guess. Okay, go a on. Pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> almost, yeah. Well, that would be almost like the pyramid of wealth. Uh, certainly, there's a diagram in economics which tells us that if you care about inequality, inequality has to get worse before it gets better, and growth will make it better. Oh. So it's a picture that looks like this. So if you care, as economies get richer, inequality is going to get worse, but don't worry, it's going to get better again later. It sounds like trickle down. That is that diagram underpins trickle-down theory. And the, the, the worst of it is that diagram isn't even true. The data is false. Clearly not. Clearly yeah. not. But, but that image of it, like an upside-down U oh, is so embedded God. in the economist's mind yes. that people justify trickle-down. People talk about austerity economics as if it's going to lead to a better world. So we need to get these old pictures out of our minds. Because if we want to tell a Absolutely. new story, we need new pictures to tell them by. Totally. So my book is about finding those destructive old story and pictures that are holding us back and replacing them with new a ones. new narrative. Including... Pictures and words. Pictures stories. And words. Stories. Well, the most powerful stories in the world are often told with pictures. That's right. From children's storybooks to the stories of creation. Think of the roof of the Sistine Chapel, right? God creating Adam and there's fingers touching. Well, when you under... Of course. When you understand, and that distorted our understanding of God for the past, you know, 500 years. <laughs> Another story. Yes. But 
when you, you understand a little bit about the way the brain works and the mind, you understand that it is pictorial in nature. Absolutely. More than half of the nerve fibers in our brains Absolutely. are connected to our visual yes. system. And, exactly. And the images get stored in the visual mm. cortex at the back of the mind, and they stay there much longer than words which pass through and don't, don't get hooked in unless they have an image to hook yes. them to. They're very important, but we think through imagery. Yes, It's exactly. our first access point for a thought. I think that's, that's right. That's how foundational it's, it is. It might not be true for everybody, but many people say, I think visually, I like drawing pictures. And, and almost embarrassed because in our education systems, it's words or even equations that apparently is the sort of scientific and, and superior method of thinking. Whereas yes. many people say, I, actually, I just prefer drawing it. And I've always drawn it. So I feel like this was a discovery for me to realize that I can describe economics and I can, I can teach people economics. Uh, with pictures, because when I, when I tell people I've... And you're I've, also a photographer, right? I am so a photographer. My, images. Yeah, or, my yeah. worlds are coming together. Yeah. But when I say to people, I've written a book about economics, the number of people, first they draw back, and they say, oh, oh, I wouldn't understand that because I was never very good at maths at school. And I say, well, the only numbers in the book are the page numbers. Don't worry. Because <laughs> I don't, you don't need to talk That's about good. economics through maths. Yeah. I've shown it through pictures. And I've had a wonderful response, actually. Lots of people emailing me and tweeting me saying, I'm banging the kitchen table saying, yes, yes, this makes sense and I understand it and I never thought I'd find myself reading an economics book and enjoying it. So that's, I'm really pleased this because... This is so heartening. <laughs> yeah, it really is. I want to get down into, Kate, what it looks like. If we take a, uh, a for-profit corporation mm -hmm. as it stands right now, mm -hmm. How can that be uh, donutted? How can okay. that be transformed to be in accordance with what your uh, principles are? Great, great question. Right in at the heart of the matter. So, in order to get into the donut, I believe we need to stop pursuing growth for growth's sake because nothing in nature grows forever. Nature grows and then comes to maturity and thrives. So if we want to learn from biomimicry in 3.8 billion years of experimentation yes. by the world, perhaps we should start thinking, what, nature, would, it, nature. what would it be like yes. by nature? What would it be like to create an accompany that grows while well, that's a healthy thing to do and then can thrive? I think instead of this growth mentality, we need to pursue two design principles to create an economy that is distributive by design, by which I mean Value created is shared far more equitably with all of those who help to create it. Mm -hmm. An example would be an employee-owned company yes. where profits generated are shared amongst all of those who, whose work created rather than a shareholder-driven company where the profits are taken off to fickle and often distant shareholders who never set foot over the premises. Right. So it's just, just cream off the top. That's right. So create one that's distributive by design but also regenerative by design mm -hmm. in the sense that instead of cutting against the living world, you know, we take Earth's resources, we make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. So this linear, degenerative line of, of 20th century industry is cutting against the living processes of our world. Absolutely. We need to become regenerative so that we use resources again and again rather than using them up. So distributive and regenerative by design. Come back to your question, what would it look like for one of today's for-profit companies to try and do that? Well, Sometimes companies look at the donut and this challenge and, and the first response I hear from them is, well, that's got nothing to do with me. The business of business is business, that old 20th century mantra. Oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but that's so last century, we've got to move on. Yes. Right. The next level up, they all no, say... No, it's actually 19th century. Thank you. <laughs> the next level up is, okay, I'll do some of this if I can see that it pays. I'll do what pays. I'll cut my carbon if you can show me that I'm going to get savings out of that. Still not good enough, that's incremental. We've got to go higher and higher on this. We need to be transformative. We need to be regenerative and distributed by design. And I think what that actually means is the company, instead of needing to look at the world and the products it's making, needs to look at itself and how it's structured. So I would say, what's your mission of your company? Is it to maximize shareholder returns? Or do you actually have living purpose, as Marjorie Kelly would say? Do you have living purpose to do something positive in the world, something bigger than yourself? If you have a purpose driven, purpose driven and a, and a living social environmental purpose rather Absolutely. than the yeah, we're driven by maximizing Dollars, shareholder returns. Pieces of paper. So you need a new per yeah. you need to incorporate that purpose. And anyone who wants shares or equity in your company knows that your purpose is a bigger mission. So some of it will be a return, a fair return to them. 
but some of what you do will be driven by social or environmental benefit. So living purpose at the heart, how you're financed, so that you're, you're not financed, you're not structured only by responding to that short-term short share price. You could have uh, equity where you promise a fair return, a 4% uh, return, for example, it's fixed. And then other, the other benefits are going off to, in other directions. And also being involved not in, in a sort of traditional commodity supply chains where you're sourcing from the cheapest supplier, but ethical chains. So you build up longer term relationships. And of course, companies that do this. Oh, I'm breathing better, Kate. <laughs> companies that start <sighs> doing this not only thrive, their employees actually want to come to work because they can bring their whole selves to work. They're proud to tell their friends where they work. They feel that it actually is aligned with their values. And so, of course, they are more engaged. Um, it's better. It, well, it makes more see, sense. You see, this is the whole domain. I've been hanging out in this world for decades, quite honestly, and of course, more lately. But um, social enterprise corporations, yes. B corporations, yes. some nonprofit corporations, i.e., you know, a better world. These are. It's it's a value structure. These yes. are very human and eco sensitive values that you're talking about, and having, in a sense, multiple bottom lines. Yes, and it just shows that you can create new structures of business, new forms of business models, new forms of financing that actually allow us to unleash regenerative and distributive potential. Because the, the, the desire is there in so many people's hearts. The design possibilities are there. 21st century designers can say, I can create a building for you that takes in dirty city air, sends it around the building and puts it out cleaner back into the exactly. city. Transmutes what, it. Yes. And what we need is finance and business that actually is aligned with that value rather than blocking it. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I am so aligned with this. And I, a lot of my business life has been about promulgating mm. these values and technologies that help to support it, right. especially, you know, in the environmental space. Great. But I, I totally get what you mean. In fact, before we began, you mentioned finance. And I'm just getting educated about that piece that I really haven't known much about. I've known more about the operation and entrepreneurial activity of a business. But through a, a futurist and dear friend of mine who I need to inter introduce you to named Hazel Henderson, who, do you know her? Uh, Hazel Henderson's layer cake she drew this wonderful cake about, yes, of course. well, that was the She's first well diagram. Known. I had that yeah, diagram pinned that. by my desk and it's actually, in some ways, is in the donut. The first donut I drew was based on her layer cake, so <laughs> okay. all praise be to Hazel Henderson. Oh yeah, she's become a very dear friend of mine. I love her to, to pieces and uh, amazing thinker about these things. Yes. She was telling me recently about how finance really does control so much of what happens in companies. And it's sort of like the step behind yes. the company. Yes. And that even CPAs and the way they manage the ledgers can change. So, for instance, in the oil space, um, by calling oil that hasn't yet been burned yes. on the level of asset instead of, um, I guess, expenditure or um, I, I don't know what other word to use, um, that changes the entire kind of corporate picture and yes. profit and loss statement. It, it's not what it was. So here it is, something I had never thought about. A change by a CPA on a piece of paper can change the entire mindset of a company. Yes. And they'll become willing to do what we'll call the right thing of being eco-friendly um, and human-friendly um, based on some numbers on a spreadsheet. Right. And it shows how important it is, the models we create for ourselves of how the world works. Absolutely. And what we take into account and what we ignore. And it's about partly about so talking to current power, which lies in finance and financial managers. If you can <laughs> present that in a language that they then see and make the invisible visible, then you can transform the mindset and, and the volition of those running the company. Absolutely. You know, it's Kate, it's so interesting that you went into economics for the same reason I went into the field of psychology. To change the world. Right. You know, I grew up at a time of the Vietnam era. Mm. And I looked around at adults and I said, you're kidding. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you've got to be kidding. This whole idea of going to war and killing people as a way of resolving conflict, this doesn't work. And I said, the issue is not political. It's not economic. It's human. 
yeah. and it's emotional. Yeah. And I'm going to get down to the layer of emotional yeah. distortion yeah. and psychological misunderstanding and misperception that created the thought that war or a 1%, 99% kind of economy is happening. Yes. And well, so I've been collapsing it ever since mm. into, well, now I call it a better world. But, you know, but that's the perspective. I went in to change the world because I saw the issue, Fantastic. not as an economic one, yeah. but expressed through economics. Yes. But it's really an inner issue, ultimately a spiritual crisis. So this question of the human at the heart of economics, and we can ask ourselves, who are we at the heart of economics? Well, there's yeah. a character called Rational Economic Man at the heart yes. of economic theory. And he's never Isn't actually... Isn't that funny? He's ne <laughs> Talk about an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. He's never actually drawn in the textbooks. But if he was, he'd yeah. be a man. He'd be standing alone. A white man. A white man. European or American. Standing alone, money in his hand. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Money in his hand, ego in his heart, yes. calculator in his head, and That's nature right. at his feet. And this is who we are told we are by economics. And one of the most fascinating oh. things I learned in researching this for this book is that when we are told that he's like us, we actually become more like him. Yes. And research with economic students in the US and in Israel has found that the more students learn about rational economic man, the more self-interested they become and the less value they give to uh, values like compassion and altruism. So this to me is fascinating because it puts a huge responsibility on how we describe ourselves. Absolutely. It shapes who we actually become. And that's why we need to take that old model, that old portrait of rational economic man out because he's, he's causing us to think that we're competitive, we need to be greedy. Uh, it's just not who we can be. We need a new portrait of humanity at the heart of economics that recognizes our interdependence, our social interdependence, our mutuality, uh, our reciprocal behaviors. It recognizes that we're not dominant over nature. We're deeply embedded within the web of life. Mm -hmm. We're not rational in a calculating sense. We're heuristic, which means we live by the rule of thumb and actually we often do better by it. So this portrait yes, is being nice. written by psychiatrists, by psychologists, yeah. neuroscientists, political philosophers. And I think it's the most important portrait that's going to be commissioned in the 21st century because if we can tell ourselves a more generous story of who we are, that will shape who we become and we might even actually have a chance of thriving together this century. Oh my God, I love it. You know, you're reminding me a little bit of uh, Annie Leonard's animation called The Story of Stuff, which... I absolutely know and love. You absolutely know and love, of course. Right. She's now the director of Greenpeace in the United right. States, actually. Right, right. Um, because I tried to get her on the show. You know, I was so inspired by that. her animations. Uh -huh. That, so the subtitle of my book is Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. And I've yes. been working with some of the world's best stop motion animators. And we've made oh. a one minute video for each of those seven ways. So if your viewers want to go on my website, which Please. is kateraywith.com, and there's a tab for animations, you can see these seven ways. They're fun. They're playful. Everybody can understand them. It'd be great if people... Yes. Share them around, social media. Show them to your professors. Ask your economics professor, why we'll are we these, learning this? We'll get these on Fantastic. our website. Absolutely. Great. Because I think we can take economics out of equations, out of the classroom, bring it into our bodies, because we're all That's economists. Right. It means household managers. That's and we're right. all shaping the ancient the Greek. household. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so it's so interesting. I always laughed. I took one class in economics, actually just one day of one class in economics. Is that enough? Uh, yeah, it was enough. Because <laughs> I saw they were full of, they didn't understand yeah. human psyche. Yeah. They were only looking at, and they cannot even ascribe it to Adam Smith. No, poor No, Adam not Smith. at all. This poor man Adam. has been done a poor disservice. Adam. He understood the generosity of man yes. and soul. Yes. You know, he understood that. Um, but um, what I wanted to, I, the reason I mentioned Annie Leonard is I was thought of, I thought of her and that animation based on what you were saying about the donut and uh -huh. the image that has now spread from you yes. and your work to parts of China and yeah. all over the world. Yeah. So, so that brief animation of hers in the story yes. of stuff also did something parallel. Yes. And yes. so simple, these little diagrams yes. are having such an impact. Yes. And so now yours are beginning to do same. Yeah. You know? and, and I it, think it's fantastic. It's realizing the power of our visual intelligence and the desire exactly. for a positive alternative story. Absolutely. Now, I just want to bring another story in, which is that of neuroscience and neuropsychology, which is showing us that our real 
way of adapting and surviving is through bonding. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely different story than what was ascribed to, to Charles Darwin, who has also done a wrong because yes. it wasn't about survival of the fittest. That's just not appropriate to what he was saying, according to my understanding. Yes. But rather, so, we are social animals, social beings, and our bonding allows the development of oxytocin. Yes. That, of course, is known as the love and the yes. bonding hormone. It gets released when people are in communion with yes. each other, and then they therefore have an impetus to protect one another and to provide for one another. This is the basis of the social community yes. of humans that allows them to move from hunter and gatherer, then into, you know, agriculture, yes. into whatever we have now. <laughs> you yes, know? and you could even say, Charles Darwin, he probably meant not survival of the fittest, as in I'm bigger and stronger than you, but the fittingest. Those who fit mm. in survive. And I think what we see is that those yeah. who are social, who collaborate, who work in groups, these are the groups that actually survive and thrive. That's right. That's absolutely true. It's so, so this is standing our classical understanding of who we are on its head. Yes. And it's time for us to do that. And we have the science behind us. Absolutely, because, because economics was never based on science. It was, it was John Stuart Mill. Exactly. Taking, Adam Smith knew that we had his self-interest and that helps make markets work. But he also knew that our interest in others is what helps make society work. But that's oh, just yeah. too nuanced for an economic model. So John Stuart Mill, <laughs> on wanting to create a simplified model, he said, I'm picking out, for economic man, I'm just picking out this trait of man <laughs> as he is wanting to accumulate wealth. And then he said on the side, of course, nobody would actually believe we were like this. This is just a narrow perception. And they, and they picked out the, this DNA for rational economic man was just this self-interest trait. It's like taking one part of a character and then reifying it. And that's where yeah. the trouble began. Really? I didn't know that. Mm. It really was John yeah. Stuart Mill's extraction of that one linear, yeah, limited... The, 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 the part Narrow of us which desires to accumulate wealth. And, and I document this in the book, and it was such a, a learning for me, because when I learned economic theory, we didn't learn any of this. We just learned meet eat, rational economic man, meet this character. You didn't learn where he come from. When I went back over the texts, what you discover is all these economists whose theories it's based on, they gave us careful caveats. This is just one aspect of man, Mill said, but it became the character of man. The, the history of economic thought is littered with caveats that haven't been listened to. The economists gave us the idea, they said, of course this is only partial, this, is, this might not apply everywhere. They got lost and these ideas became reified mantras that supported growth and underpin capitalism. So there's all sorts of interest in, in, in simplifying that message. If you go back, it's a far more nuanced story. So I feel very sorry for a lot of these long gone economists because they would be devastated to know what had been done in the name of their ideas. Yes, absolutely. I got a bit of an education about, about uh, the wealth of nations and Adam Smith from a, an American, Canadian, Danish man, economist, but I don't think he'd like that word. But he, uh, Ross <laughs> Anderson, who's also a friend of Hazel's, by the way, uh, he uh, has something called the Gaia Foundation. Uh -huh. And he's been here as well. Um, and it's, he was saying that Adam Smith really did understand more about the full nature of man. And he would never have said the one item about self-interest as being the singular one for us to pay attention to. Yeah. But it shows the selective nature if someone thinks it's going to be to their advantage to kind of select from the menu just those items that will serve their purpose, which well, we're suffering the consequences yeah. of that right now on so many levels. So in our remaining minutes, um, what are you finding is the interest or the resistance? Now, do I understand that I checked online and it looked like there was a, a tweet that just a matter of hours ago said that there was a part of a country that wanted to adopt making donuts no uh, oh, donut yes. economics okay. yes so one of the to bring us really up to speed yeah one of the lovely things for me is 
once you release an idea into the world, you don't know who picks it up and what they do with it. And so yeah. it's, the, it's been contacted back. I've, I've been contacted with companies from Patagonia to Mars saying we're using this <sighs> to rethink our business model. But in Stockholm, Sweden, a group of urban developers contacted me. They say, we love this donut because we're developing a new suburb of Stockholm. Oh. We've got this land that we're creating a new district and we're using it as our blueprint. How do we meet the needs of the residents for their food, their transport, energy, housing, education and health within the ecological means of this area? And next week, May 8th to the 11th, 2017, they're having a workshop in Sweden, bringing together everybody they can to say, what would it look like to actually do this? And they're calling it a donut district. <laughs> And then in South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, the fastest growing town in that state, also contacted me saying, we've used your donut to re-envision the future of our town. And we involved the youth of the town and they said, we have to add one thing into the social foundation. We need food and water and health and education. We also need to have fun. It's got to be fun transforming your economy. So I love hearing from communities who've taken this as a paradigm, as an idea, a vision for the future and made it their own. Absolutely. They have to bring their own personality and character to yes. and cultural and the specificity of nuance. the place. Yes, what right. it means to have education here, the housing here, what it means to respect this ecosystem, this <clears> landscape. <throat> exactly, exactly. That's biodiversity exactly. in action, right? Exactly. Well, this has been just fantastic to explore Lovely. all of this with you. Thank you. I think you. it's wonderful work that you're doing, and I just uh, want to just continue supporting Thank what you're you. doing. Thank you. My Absolutely. pleasure. My pleasure to be here. It's uh, very much aligned with a better world, so you have Great. our vote. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Kate Rayworth, who is here from London, here at A Better World in our studio, so glad that she's joined us to help enliven these ideas that really need uh, massive circulation. So thanks so much for joining us. Contact me at mjr at abetterworld.net. Love to hear from you, your thoughts, opinions and experiences of our shows and visit us of course at www.abetterworld.tv and I look forward to seeing you all next week.